Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 32 of the Kamano Voice. On this episode, I speak to the founder of GlassQuest, as well as the Great Northwest GlassQuest. Please welcome Mark Ellinger. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Kamano Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Kamano Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. Uh, I hope you guys are having a good day out there, and hopefully some of you are questing. Uh, I think this should be releasing during Glass Quest. Um, anyways, I got a chance to actually interview the founder of Glass Quest, uh, here in the Northwest, uh, as well as the, the company Glass Quest, which produces all of the glass floats that everyone is looking for. Um, so I got to speak with Mark Ellinger and get to hear his backstory. How did he get into glass blowing uh, and how he transitioned from uh, just being a glass blower at, at someone's shop to eventually starting his very own glass blowing studio, um, which is the Glass Quest Studio. Um, we also talked about how we got started with Glass Quest, why it's in February, and uh, yeah, just kind of some of the neat history. He also walks us through the process of glass blowing. Um, I've also linked to a video that he made of him doing a full glass blowing, showing you the process start to finish of how he makes these floats. Uh, so be sure to check that out in the link in the description below. Um, but without further ado, here's my conversation with Mark Ellinger. Hey, Islanders, it's Brandon with the Camino Voice, and today I'm here with the founder of Glass Quest, uh, Mark Ellinger. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Glad to be here. So before we jump into the podcast, uh, tell us a little, a little bit about Mark. Oh, a little bit about me, huh? Um, well, I've been blowing glass for uh, 37 years and uh, started with, for a company back in 83, a couple of guys that started a little glass blowing company back in uh nor it's uh north city um and it's a little two-car garage they started a company called ornamental blown glass and they hired me and about three other guys and uh, i started working for them back then and uh, been blowing glass ever since very cool so um how old were you when you started working for them oh gosh that's uh that's having me th do some math. Um, <laughs> gosh, I was, I must have been about uh, 23, 24. Okay. So where did you grow up? I grew up in Lake Forest Park, which okay. is in the, the north end of, um, or I guess it would be the south end of Lake Washington. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So then you <clears throat> um, went to high school. Did you go to college afterwards? Um, I only went to college just very briefly. I took a couple of community college courses and um, I got married, had kids and started blowing glass and that was kind of it. You know, that was into my college. But, uh, but yeah, I just did a, a, a real short stint at um, Everett Community College. Oh, okay. Nice. That's where I went to school. Yeah. Um, very cool. So then was that something... <clears throat> was blowing glass, was that something you were interested in, like, throughout high school and stuff, or how did you get... Uh, no, I didn't know anything really about blowing glass until I started working for the two guys that, that I started working for at Ornamental Blowing Glass. Um, I was actually out of work, and I had my son Marcus back then, and, and of course my wife Cindy, and I was looking at uh, TV one evening and I saw one of Dale Chihuly's very first Channel 9 specials that he ever did about uh, him, you know, blowing glass. And a couple weeks after I saw that special, I saw an ad in the paper that said, uh, glass blower will train. And I looked at my wife and I said, wow, check this out. I think this is that, um, th this is a, somebody wants to hire a glass blower and this is the the special that we saw the other night about glass blowing, and she, I said, "Do you think we should go down and apply?" And she just about kicked me in the rear and said, "Yeah, go get a job." So, uh, 
So I, I got some stuff together and I went down and applied um, these guys. They, they probably interviewed about 200 people. Wow. And okay. And they hired me and uh, they liked me and uh, like these three other guys. And um, I started working for them. I didn't start working for them right away. Um, <coughs> at least blowing glass. They were looking for um, somebody to help fill their furnaces and do some grunt work and stuff like that for a while, work the evenings. And so I started out doing that with them, and they had to they told me that they would work me into glass blowing eventually as the company grew. Okay. And so I probably did that for about six months, and then I uh, worked my way into being a glass blower for them. Okay. <clears throat> what were you doing prior to that? Were you just working a, another job, or did you have a career path? Oh, uh, not really. I jumped around doing different things. Um, me and my wife, uh, just before that, we worked at a racquetball club, and we uh, cleaned the club. I was um, way into racquetball back then, and so it got me into the club and, you know, and able to not pay any dues or anything and play <coughs> as much racquetball as I wanted. Nice. Uh, me and my brother were a uh, doubles team, and we played a lot of singles and went to a lot of racquetball tournaments back then. So, um yeah, we, we did that at night, and then during the day, I'd go in and play racquetball. I'd bring my son, Marcus, who works with me now, into uh, the racquetball club with me. We'd throw him in a uh, racquetball <laughs> court with a ball and shut the door, and we it had big glass walls in the courts back then, so we could watch him, you know, yep. trying to chase the ball around in there. He was in there for hours. It was a good way to keep him busy and nice. keep him out of trouble. Yeah, very cool. So then you started working for um, this company with these two guys, um, and then, so for the first six months, did it feel like it was, like, were you enjoying what you were doing? I mean, not the work itself, but, like, just being around it and everything? Um, well, it was a lot of grunt work. I was <clears throat> filling up the first the furnaces with glass, and I was sifting a lot of glass and cleaning up the shop and you know, doing some of the cold work um, that they that they did, some grinding, polishing, stuff like that. So, um, but I would get there before a lot of the other guys that were blowing would be done for the day, and um, I'd see what they were doing. And every once in a while, they would let me, you know, uh, play around a little bit. But it wasn't until I actually got thrown into making their products eight hours a day that I just really, you know, got, you know, hooked on it. Yeah. So um, for those of you um, who don't know, what's kind of the process of, of glass blowing from start to finish? Uh, well, you always have, you all studios have what's called a glass furnace, and it's right around 2,000 degrees, 2,100 degrees. Okay. 24-7. It never gets um, turned off once you fire it up. And that's where you melt your glass. And then um, you pull the glass out of there on the end of a blowpipe and add all of your colors to the clear glass. So you only melt clear in that furnace. Okay. And then all of your colors get added to the glass um, as you are building and creating whatever you're making out of glass. Um, then you have uh, a couple other units in the shop. They're called glory holes, and those are the units that you use for reheating the glass because the glass cools off so quickly. Uh, you only have about 30 seconds to do whatever you're going to do with the glass because okay. then it cools off and gets hard. So you have to go back in the glory hole, get it hot, melt in your colors, get it hot so you can blow into it and shape it, um, and then... You're, so you're constantly going in and out of there. And then after you make your piece, it goes into an annealing oven. So you need a big oven, and those are about 950 degrees. And you, you put your finished glass <clears throat> into the oven and let it cool off really slow so it doesn't crack and break. Okay. Uh, if, if you would leave it out and not put it in an oven, it would crack and break within, you know, a minute or so. Okay. Um, so everything goes in the oven, stays in there for about... 24 hours right around there cools off really slow and then the next day you can take the glass out okay very cool so then <clears throat> um so you were you were going through this process what are they how do they kind of slowly introduce you to everything uh well when i started working for uh, ornamental blown glass 
they would show you how to make something. It was, um, we pretty much were a giftware manufacturer and we were making like Christmas ornaments and paperweights and eggs and, and things like that. Um, I don't know if you remember back then, they, if you saw them, um, maybe you're not old enough, but <laughs> they made uh, these round glass balls that were, are kind of like this. And um, only if you, you flipped it over and flattened the bottom, there's a hole in the top. And they were made oil lamps out of them. Okay. So um, it would have a wick in it. You'd fill them with oil, and they were like these oil lamps that you could, you know, stick around and light up. It could be scented oil or whatever, but um, those were a huge item back when I was working for them. Okay. And we made just tens of thousands of those things. (laughs) I sent them all over the country. Nice. Very cool. So then with, with those or any other shape or anything that you're doing... Is everything freehand? Um, Mostly, yeah. Everything that um, I do now in my studio is pretty much freehand. Back when I worked for Ornamental Blown Glass, in the later years that I worked for him, I worked for him for 15 years. Okay. And in the later years, uh, middle years that I worked for him, uh, we did have some molds that we would blow glass into for some of our vases and things like that, just so we could be really consistent on the shape. Right. But... They, um, the color designs that we would put on the glass would be different because there's no way you can, you know, duplicate that right. from piece to piece. So that's what made them really different. Yeah. So how do the molds work? Because you've got this super hot glass that you're blowing. If it touches anything cool, it will shatter. So how does that work? Um, well, the molds are, um, the ones that we used a lot were made out of metal. Okay. And then you would coat the molds on the inside with this cork material. You'd put this glue (coughs) stuff in there and then you'd take this cork and sprinkle that over the glue and let it dry. Okay. And then, um, you would drop your hot glass in there off the blowpipe, just kind of drip it in and blow into the mold as you're turning and the the glass will not stick to the cork after it's burnt because it creates this layer of carbon on it. Okay. And you also keep it wet. So um, when it's wet, it actually creates a layer of steam that oh. comes out of the cork or the wood. Um, we also ma- had molds that were made out of wood. And so the steam creates a layer where it you can turn it in there and the glass won't stick to it. Yeah. And there's holes in the mold so that when you're blowing into it, the glass will fill up the mold and the steam and the air, the open spaces will, um, the air can escape. So the glass will fill up the mold. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. And <clears throat> I've, I've seen a couple of videos, but like when you're saying blowing, you're, you're blowing through this tube. Like you're taking deep breaths and like, yeah, you don't, uh, it's kind of a question we get a lot is how hard do you have to blow? You have right. To, you know, people say, well, you must have to have a lot of lung power yeah. to blow, but, um, it, that's not really the case because when you're blowing cold air into the hot glass, the air wants to expand from the heat. So, um, a lot of the expansion of the air in there is, um, actually making the bubble get bigger so you don't really have to blow real hard okay unless you're making you know this massive thing you know then you got to blow kind of hard to put more air into it but um, a lot of times if people are making really massive pieces they actually use compressed air okay on the end of the pipe because they have to put so much air into it yeah but when we're making like the glass floats small things like that you're really not blowing very hard. You're just keeping pressure on it and and blowing very lightly, and you can just see it start to expand. Okay, very cool. What is uh, either at the the other um, studio or at your own, what was the biggest, um, like, piece that you guys ever made? Um, Well, I made some pieces. uh, Let's see, I can't remember what year it was, but when the, the roaster started here, and um, they had the very first restaurant that was where the library is now. Yeah, Islanders. The Islanders, yeah. Um, there was some um, big um, spinners up in the ceiling yes. that were used for lights. Uh, yep. It was like lighting decorations. And uh, 
we made those for for that. So that was some of the biggest pieces that we made. They were probably about uh, I don't know thirty two inches uh, wow. across. And uh, I was like maxing out my equipment <laughs> to to make those. So that was one of the probably one of the bigger pieces, blown pieces that we ha uh, ever did. Um, and then in the library here at the Commons, there's a sculpture in there that's probably one of the biggest pieces, but it's made out of um, you know multiple pieces. But okay. it's actually a sculpture that's hanging in the library. Yeah. And so that's probably. Um, one of the bigger sculpture pieces that we've ever done. Got it. So as far as like the glass sculptures and stuff, how do you end up fusing? Because if it's multiple pieces, do you fuse them in the end then? And how do you do that? Um, you know, it's <clears throat> there's lots of ways that you can put glass together. Usually, um, like in Chihuly's, you know, sculptures that he's putting together, his big chandeliers and things like that, there's actually a metal frame that is holding all the glass pieces together. Okay. And in the one in the library, we actually used um, copper because copper, you can actually fuse right into the molten glass. Oh, it's, okay. It sticks to the copper, and then when it cools off, copper cools off about the same rate as the glass does, so oh, it, won't, nice. it won't crack and break. Yeah. So um, we used some copper tubing and put all of our glass um, on the copper tubing and then built all the frame out of copper so we could just put them all together that way very cool um <clears throat> so um so you were with that company for about 15 years when did uh what kind of happened that made you think that you wanted to go out on your own after that um well i think that's you know that's something that i think every glass blower that it starts blowing glass or even people that take a class and they <clears throat> really get hooked on it they're dream is, wow, I'd really like to have a studio myself, right, and do this. And um, so that's that's kind of, I think, everybody who starts blowing glass that kind of has that and wants to do it. But um, for me, it was more out of necessity. I was working for this company for 15 years, and I kind of saw the writing on the wall. At one point, we were one of the largest giftware manufacturers on the West Coast. Wow, okay. And we had about 28 employees. And then the guy that owned it kind of got burnt out on the business, and it slowly just kind of started fading. And um, I kind of saw the writing on the wall, and, and about four years before it actually folded, I started building my studio and uh, kind of getting ready for, you know, what was going to happen there. I had, when I worked for him, I had developed a design bonus incentive for the company, so I was getting... Um, a percentage of all the sales that went out. Um, this design bonus incentive was meant to have our glass blowers be more creative and um, get a percentage of any products that they designed. Yeah. So to try and get them to be creative and come up with new products. <clears throat> um, but unfortunately, it didn't quite work that way. And I ended oh, up doing okay. most of the designing and creating for the company. And so when the company started to fold, the owners couldn't pay me my design bonus incentive, and it just kept building. Yep. And when the company finally folded, the guy just said, hey, just take whatever you want, just take everything. And so after about four years of waiting, uh, the company got down to about three or four employees, and then he finally just said, all right, we're done, I'm just shutting the doors. And he said, come get whatever you want and take it up to my shop that I was building. So okay. that's kind of how I got into it. And I didn't really realize at the time, um, you know, what I was getting into. Uh, I kind of did, but once you start your own business like that, it's yeah. like pretty crazy. It's glass blowing is probably one of the most expensive art forms that you can take on because of the expenses, the overhead that's involved with energy and glass costs and electricity and, um, you know, you got your propane your electricity, the cost of the glass is really expensive. So um, you have to sell a lot of glass to be able just to keep blowing glass. Yeah. So it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Well, and then you mentioned that the the glass furnace doesn't get shut off once you start get going. Is that like, do you ever shut that down or? Oh, you don't. That's something that every uh, studio kind of dreads. 
it happens because the glass and when it's in its molten form <clears throat> is probably one of the corrosive most corrosive materials known it will eat through just about anything oh, okay. so after a period of time the glass actually eats away at the crucible uh, that is holding the glass inside the furnace and it'll get a hole in it and then you got to tear your furnace apart and rebuild it and put a new crucible in um, and then start over again. But uh, my longest furnace that we've had run was about nine and a half years okay. for me, which is a long time. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm kind of hoping every time a furnace goes down for us, we try and make improvements in it and, and try and get it to last longer. So yeah. I'm hoping that this last rebuild that we did was going to you know, be longer than nine and a half years. <laughs> okay. So then what was that like getting started? How did you start getting clients and, and customers and stuff? Oh, uh, well, I was really fortunate that when I started, um, the company that I worked for, Ornamental Blown Glass, I mean, he gave me everything. So he gave me all the files, all the clients. And so when I started in my studio, I was actually making a lot of the products that we made back then and all of the clients that still wanted, you know, um, those products, I would just make them. I did a lot of those oil lamps when I first started there and, you know, paperweights and eggs and things like that. Um, and I developed some other things. The, the goal was to kind of get into more of a higher end market, and, yeah. you know, as, as much as I could and, and gradually develop that market. And it took, you know, many, many years for me to be able to do that. But, um, but eventually, with the help of my son, Marcus, um, having two people really helps in expanding what you can do. Yeah. Um, a lot of the products, when I first started, um, my wife actually was my assistant. So some of the bigger pieces that I did, she was helping me reheat the pieces and, um, you know, She'd re keep them hot while I would go get some other colors or more glass to it, add on to it. And that was about the extent of, of her helping me. That's, that's what she could do. So I was kind of limited there, but I was able to do more than I could by myself. And right. then when my son Marcus started working for me, things just kind of really expanded because the better he got, the, the more things we could do. And so we've developed into a higher end market now and trying to keep bumping that up as much as we can and, and expand our um, creativity and things that we can do and get better and make bigger, better things, fancier things. Yeah. So were you, <clears throat> um, so you're currently located in Stanwood now, right? Yes. So were you, is that where you set up shop after you left here? After the company? Yes. Yeah, I, um, I, I lived in um, Mukilteo for quite a while, and then we wanted to get out of Mukilteo and move somewhere, and it just happened that I ended up finding a place in Stanwood, and uh, we moved up there. And so I commuted from Stanwood down to Linwood is where the, we ended up, the company ended up, and so I did that for quite a while, and then, um, but yeah, I've always always lived in Stanwood since I've I started GlassQuest. You know, my my company, GlassQuest. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so you, how long were you just? It was it just you doing all this stuff. When did you were you able to start bringing Marcus into this? Let's see, Marcus. He's I think he's been working for me for about thirteen years now. Okay. So, um, yeah, so about 13 years ago, he started working for me part-time because he had his own business at that time. He was a house painter, with, had a painting business with oh, okay. a friend of his. So he would come in and help me um, when they were in between jobs, <coughs> and that's how he kind of got started. And um, when the economy, cr economy crashed, um, you know, back you know, a little while ago, um, his painting business wasn't going so great. So, and his partner wanted to go back to school. So they just kind of, um, 
folded up their painting business, and that's when he started working for me full time. Okay, nice. <coughs> How was uh, was that um, was that something like he had was he trying to continue on in his painting business and stuff, or was that something that um, was always kind of a secondary option? Like he was interested in learning, going deeper into that the glass quest or the glass blowing. Um, I think it. It kind of, for him, it was just something that was, um, that he was interested in. He's uh, also a, a pretty good artist. He he's, does a lot of drawing and uh, does some, like, cartoon drawings, and um, he's way into electronics and stuff like that. He's really good with Photoshop. And so I think it naturally kind of, he went towards the artistic part of the glass blowing. <coughs> excuse me and um so he kind of fell into it pretty easily <clears throat> but uh, it takes a while to really learn how to blow glass so it's kind of baby steps when somebody's working for you you're having them um do things that you know they can do and um maybe you know if they're interested then they can expand and try to do things on their own when they have time when i worked for the company for 15 years the guy that owned that company was just super cool and he would let us go down and blow glass on our lunchtime and make whatever we want he would let us come into the shop on the weekends and make whatever we wanted and let us you know if we wanted to go put it in a gallery or try and sell it or whatever um he was all over that, and so I took advantage of that all the time. And I was at lunch; I was down there trying to make stuff, and on the weekends I was in there trying to make stuff and learning stuff. And he had a lot of glass blowing book, uh, glass blowing books that we could look at from uh, like the Art Nouveau period and <clears throat> Lalique and uh, all those periods of glass. So I would go up there and look at. Uh, look at these books and the, some of the patterns in them and designs were incredible. And I was like, well, how do they do that? And so I would go down into the shop and um, I'd ask the owner, his name was Steve. I'd say, Steve, how do they do these designs? And he would, he knew. And so he would tell me how to do it. And, and so I'd go down and practice and try doing them and come up with some of my own. And uh, so that's kind of how I got started. So Marcus kind of, is uh you know learning how to do that too and so he uh he's really good at sculpting the glass so when we're doing sculptures and uh doing things like that it's a lot of fun working together because uh, he'll make one and then i'll make one and he'll do something a little bit different than i would do it but yeah. yet i'm learning from him you know, wow, that worked out pretty good. I'm going to try that. And then I'll try something different, and he'll see how I do it. And he'll go, oh, wow, I see what you did there. Okay, I'm going to do that in my next piece that I make. And so we kind of build off each other. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's great. Um, did, uh, um, was was it uh, Dave? Not Dave. Uh, your boss. Oh, Steve. Steve, Steve sorry. Mm -hmm. Totally terrible things that's okay me too <laughs> what's your name uh, yeah <laughs> exactly <laughs> just, kidding. just kidding um did he help you out when as you were getting started back up did you go back and talk with him once you went out on your own um not a real lot at <clears throat> first but um he did not 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 too long ago he's come up to my studio i have shows at my studio yeah and he's come up several times and visited and just hung out and uh you know seeing what i'm up to and he actually grabbed a blowpipe a couple times and wanted to just try blowing bubbles right and uh, that's what he used to call it when i worked for him he said oh, let's go down and blow bubbles right so um he's come up a few times and played around a little bit and watched and hung out while I've, i have a show there and uh, you know answer questions and talk to people and stuff and he's had a good time so yeah he, cool. he's a super nice guy nice so <clears throat> where did you come up with the idea for glass quest the actual event well that came about from um actually lincoln city oregon started uh, an event down there and i started making floats for them back in 2001 
they started the event down there in 2000 and they came to me and wanted to know if I wanted to make floats for them and I said sure and so we started making floats for Lincoln City and then a couple years after that I was approached by a person from Florida who wanted to get some things going on the East Coast that were like Lincoln City. And so um, he was trying to be the middleman in between the coastal communities on the East Coast and get something going like Lincoln City has going now. They, they're they still doing it in Lincoln City. And um, so I started doing it for them at Lincoln City and back in Jekyll Island. and. I figured, well, why don't we do something here on, you know, in Stanwood and Camino? And I thought the parks would be a great place to do it because all the other events are on these really nice sandy beaches. <laughs> yep. And around here, we don't really have the luxury of having all these nice sandy beaches, and the tide comes up pretty high on a lot of our beaches, so it's kind of hard to... Um, put the actual glass balls out on the beaches like they do down there. And so I brought this idea up of starting an event here to lots of people over a couple years. And I got a, there was a lady named Doris Plattis who really took charge of, you know, getting it going and talking to the chambers and kind of bringing other people together and, we came up with this idea. Um, actually, Doris is the one that came up with the idea of, of using these plastic balls to hide that you would look for in the businesses and in the parks and to draw people into town to actually go into the businesses. And, um, and then if you find one of these plastic balls, that's when you turn it in for a glass ball. So, um, like, when, when I hide all my plastic balls in the parks, I put a business card in there. And so when people find the plastic ball, they know to come to my studio and then collect their glass ball. Some of the businesses that put the plastic ball in their businesses, they get to, if they find it in the business, they get to pick out their glass ball, at, you know, right then at the business. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it just really took off. Um, the first year we started, it was the year that the Olympics were up in Vancouver, the Winter Olympics. Okay. And so that was a big motivation for this original group to um, get this ball rolling and get this happening because we knew we were going to get a lot of traffic going up I-5. And if we could get people to come in here for this event, um, and we were just going to get a lot of exposure. Yeah. So <clears throat> it was kind of a, kind of a last minute push to get this all to happen that very first year that it that it took off yeah and there was a um, several people that were involved to make it all happen um, there was a guy named Bill Boring who um, he's done a lot in the community here in Stanwood and Camino Jack Gunter was involved he actually um, was involved in some of the artwork for the very first poster and things okay. like that um, so there were some other people, too, that uh, I can't remember their names because I'm bad with names, too. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, it was, a, it was a group effort and a lot of work to, to bring it all together for the first you know, few years. Okay. We, we did it. Yeah. So then... <coughs> excuse me. Did it end up in February because you were trying to align it with the Winter Olympics then? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that was part of it. And the other reasoning for that is that... Um, you know, February is a pretty slow time here in, you know, Stanwood and Camino. Yeah. So we were trying to bring tourists into the area at the slower time of the year. Yeah. And, you know, get people in here. So, and, yeah, I mean, who would have known that it uh, is just grown and is so popular, you know, as it is now. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, and we get people, I mean, people that have come year after year and they come from all over. Oh, at yeah. this point. Yeah, so. and they uh, they come and they, I got talked to people that come here. They take the whole week off of work 
and they come over here and rent a place to stay, and they're just you know out looking every day for those plastic balls. Yeah, yeah, they're just totally hooked on it. It's crazy. And I know out at uh, Cama Beach, the cabins out there just you know get booked up too because people are booking up the cabins and and you know hanging out there because we ha- they hide some of the class balls at Cama Beach too. So yeah, um, yeah, it's it's crazy. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's it's a really really neat event, and um, yeah, definitely that those that week and a half during February when that's going on, it's there's people everywhere and mm. they're, they're wandering all about, and it's pouring rain and oh yeah, um, but rain, snow, <laughs> I mean it's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. can remember so, uh, a couple of years when I first started, um, I was hiding all of the balls in the park, and that was kind of my my. <laughs> my part to the event and back then it was uh well, i think it was started out with like 50 to 60 balls that i would be hiding myself and i would go out and try and hide these all in the parks and one year it snowed pretty good <laughs> and i was heading down to uh, the south end of camano the state park because i was i was hiding two of them down there one at the mm-hmm. south end of the park and one at the north end of the park and it started snowing when I left my place in Stanwood, and it just kept getting more and more and more snow. And by the time I got down there, there was a you know a, an inch or two of snow on the ground, and it was still snowing really hard. <laughs> and uh, so that it, it was a lot of fun trying to figure out how am I going to hide these plastic balls in the snow. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it didn't slow people down. They were just still getting out there and and i wasn't i was thinking i wasn't going to make it home that time when i went down there it was <laughs> yeah. snowing so much yeah so uh, yeah it's pretty crazy yeah very cool yeah down on the south end of the island when it snows uh it's a totally different world <laughs> it is yes it is all right um so lastly what do you kind of see as the future of your studio um well right now we're talking about um trying to maybe build another building uh, in back of my studio. I think I, we would really like to have more of a, a gallery type of a setup where I can have a lot of my work out all the time. We probably have, uh, I don't know, five or six shows at my studio now, you know, seasonal type shows every year. And um, it's a lot of work because we change the whole shop around from its production state to a um, almost like a gallery kind of a setting um, outside and inside because we do a lot of garden art too and so when we're having a show we pull everything out change the whole shop around have all of our pieces out for people to come and see and purchase and then after the show's over we put everything away in tubs and on shelves and we have to cover everything in plastic because the studio is actually pretty dusty from, yeah from all the glass and and dust and stuff that's going on and so i think what we're really looking at trying to do is put up another building and make a more of a gallery type setting there so people can come and i can just leave what we're what we have available out all the time for yeah. people to come and see so that's kind of our goal right now and maybe expanding and trying to get into, you know, keep bumping up our products to a higher level, higher end, um, maybe do some more sculpture type things, um, garden art and things like that, um, that actually take multiple pieces and more time to do. And also in that building that if we put up, we'll have an area where we can, you know, put things together like that. And um, this, the studio we're, we're blowing now is, it's an old Quonset hut. So um, I don't know if, you, if people don't know what a Quonset hut, it's one of those curved metal buildings that kind of look like an airplane hangar, right? Okay, yeah. So that's where our blowing studio is now, and right now it's filled with, I mean, all kinds of stuff. The back end of it is filled with, it's still got stuff in it that I got from the company when wow, the, the okay. you know, company closed down, and uh, and because I, I use that stuff every once in a while. So um, I'd like to be able to, you know, make the Quonset Hut part of it more of just the blowing area and for people to come and watch and uh, you, there's also cold shop in there too where you do grinding and polishing and 
you know, other things like that. Um, we have a photography setup that's kind of tucked back in a corner. I'd like to have a nice area for that to yeah. take pictures of the pieces and because um, we we try and take uh, pictures of everything that we do that's you know more of a higher end type of a product and uh, we put it on the website so people can you know see what we're doing and purchase it if they want to so um, yeah I think that's kind of our goal nice to, to try and expand that way okay very cool all right. Well, I like to end every interview with some rapid fire questions. Um, <clears throat> I had, for some reason, I had always thought of you as someone that lived on Camino. So <laughs> all these questions are aimed at Camino, but I'm assuming you've spent some time here since you've been driving around for last oh, yeah. quest. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I love Camino. It's a, it's a great, great island. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, do you have a lesser known or favorite location on Camino Island that you like to hang out? Um, I don't know if it would be lesser known, but. Um, <clears throat> I really like going down to the parks. There's so many parks that you can go to on Camino and, you know, go down to the beach. And uh, I like to take my dog. Sometimes me and my wife will go down to the state park and just walk the trails and the beaches. And, um, you know, that's probably one of the, the best things that I like to do. And then that after we do spend the day, you know, hours doing that, there's a lot of places that you can stop and get some great food and, and micro brews and, you know, so we kind of make a day out of it and do that. Nice. Um, pretend you have a friend coming in from out of town. Um, what would their first day look like here on the island? Um, or Stanwood too, since you've, yeah, you've well, I was going to say, yeah, um, I probably would, um, you know, show them some of the, the things in Stanwood. Um, I'm actually uh, kind of a hunter, so I like to go down into the flats down below Stanwood and walk around on the dikes down there and, uh, you know, watch the birds and check out, take my dog down there and, you know, let her run around. So, um, so if I was going to take somebody around, I'd probably take them down to the new area down in Stanwood that they just built. Yeah. And it's got great walks down there, um, just, you know, by the by the bridge that goes on to Camino. So do <clears> that and then hop on to Camino and show them some of the sites on Camino, um, like the state parks, some of the other parks. Um, you know, if they were into artwork, I might go by Carla Matsky's place, the sculpture garden there, and, and let them check that out. She's got a really cool place there. Um, probably go by the the gallery down in town in Stanwood. Um, I've got pieces down there. It's pretty cool. It's called the Gilded Gallery. And, uh, yeah, pretty just make a day out of it. Nice. I'll probably do a little bar hopping. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's there's actually some good ones now. So. There is, yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. Uh, who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? Oh, gosh, you know, there are so many great artists and people in the community that have really uh, helped this area grow. But, uh, you know, one guy that I can think of off the top of my head who is really interesting guy, his name's John Regan. Okay. He's a uh, uh, artist kind of on the south end of the island, and he does uh, watercolors and, um, and other kinds of paintings too, and he's a really good artist, and he is a character to talk to. Okay. Yeah, he would, he would be a great interview. Very cool. Um, lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard on Camino right as you're driving on, what would that say? Oh, you know, um, I don't know. Seeing how I'm from Stanwood, I'd probably say, you know, Stanwood, the gateway to Camino Island. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, you know. I don't know. Stop at Stanwood twice. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right, Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Mark Ellinger for joining me on the podcast, and thank you for listening. If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. And for more information on this episode or previous episodes, go to kamenocommons.com slash podcast. That's kamenocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.